Customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you are a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Customer Service Revolution podcast with John DeJulius. In this week's episode, John talks with Jared Green, speaker, author, and executive coach who's known for bridging the gap between human engagement and organizational development through his company, Engage 365. Jared's mission is to reimagine and redesign the employee experience with people strategies that best support business strategies. In this episode, you'll learn how Jared went from being a former NFL professional football player to helping companies bridge the gap between human engagement and organizational development, his core four to creating an engaging workforce, how leaders can better adjust to the hybrid workforce model, and the number one trait a great leader must have. Now here's your host, John DeJulius. Hello, revolutionaries, and welcome to another episode of the Customer Service Revolution Podcast. And today I'm so excited to be speaking to Jared Green, a speaker, author, and executive coach who's most known for bridging the gap between human engagement and organizational development through his company, Engage 365. And his mission, love his mission, is to reimagine and redesign the employee experience with people, strategies that best support business strategies. And this could not be more timely or relevant coming off the pandemic. Hopefully we're in the endemic stage and coming out of the great recession. And so people doing what Jared Green is doing is just perfect. It's timely. How I got to know Jared is we share mutual clients that use us both, us for the customer experience and Jared for the employee experience. And he works with companies like Chick-fil-A and we uh, both work for a company, uh, Link, and just kept on hearing incredible things about Jared. So welcome, Jared. Man, it's a privilege. That that was a phenomenal intro. And I'm glad to be on here because of the synergy that we have uh, naturally just meeting you. And but also just both of our missions are so aligned because the customers need to be engaged and the employees need to be engaged. And they are so closely connected because they connect with each other. So this is really right on time. Yeah, no, and, and, and I'm excited because I think you have a lot to share. So excited that Jared is one of our amazing subject matter experts speaking at this year's 2022 Customer Service Revolution Conference, November 8th and 9th in Cleveland. So we'll get to that later. But Jared, tell everyone a little bit about your backstory and what uh, led you to here. So to start way back, but to not be long, I was born in Washington, D.C. My father, Daryl Green, who is now in the Hall of Fame NFL Top 100, he played on the Super Bowl team of Joe Gibbs back in the day. And my earliest childhood memory is 1991 being in that Minnesota stadium when the Redskins won the Super Bowl. And from that point on, I lived a very engaged life. They used to call it privileged life or what we you know, whatever they want to call it. But I call it engaged that all the people around me had my best interest and they wanted me to win. I ended up going to the NFL myself, playing for three years. And during my time in the NFL, I recognized that it is not normal to be this engaged, which I had a sports psychiatrist. I had a life coach. I had a position coach, a trainer, uh, a physical fitness coach, a nutritionist. All of these people were engaging me at the highest level. And that's why I was able to perform. So when I left football, I said, I want to create the environment and the experience that I had as a child and as a professional athlete for employees in organizations so that if they can be engaged at the level that I was, then they'll perform their best on the field, you know, in their 
respective organizations and industries. So that's really why Engage 365 came about. And I'll say this lastly, I was doing a lot of speaking and I felt like, man, I'm speaking, but this one moment's not enough for me to really engage the organization. It was exciting. It was a woo moment. But if I could get into the organization and, and encourage and engage their employees at a high level on a regular basis, hence the 365, then we could really see the change. And, and we've been doing that for six years now. It's been wonderful. That's awesome. I, I love your backstory because while you certainly had unbelievable privileges, we've seen too many stories, whether it's in athletics or just in life, people that have privileges take for granted and not take advantage of those privileges. And, you know, one of my, uh, I heard a great quote recently that when you're successful, be humble because most of it wasn't your fault. Right. <laughs> and, you know, too, mm-hmm. too often we're like, yeah, I'm the greatest. Well, yeah, if you are and whatever success you've had or I've had, I'm going to speak for myself, man, it took an army to help me get there. And without oh, yeah. that army, you know, I wouldn't, you know, be where I am. So I, I really like that you were had the, you know, the wherewithal to realize and take advantage of that. So why employee engagement? Because of, of, of to be, you know, that to be your your niche. Because a lot of times when you see former professional athletes, they do go into speaking, but they go into more of the motivational side. What intrigued you and made you, you know, so hungry? to go down the pipeline of employee engagement? You know, I was raised a certain way. You know, my father always told me stories about my grandfather. I only knew my grandfather for about the first 10 to 15 years of my life before he passed, but he worked at Maxwell Coffee House for 20 and this years. Is, uh, your dad's dad, right? My dad's dad, yeah. yep. And, you know, being that he worked a job and was an employee, and, and that's during the 40s and the 50s, yeah. you know, a very hard time. Uh, and where he was in Houston, Texas, where my blue family collar was job, blue collar job. Um, he was on on that line. You know, they they were working the the beans and and testing the beans and all that stuff. So I I've always had a deep empathy for the employees, the the workers, the workforce. And then when I remember going into work with my dad at Redskin Park. My dad knew every employee's name. That's he awesome. would walk in, Miss BJ. I, I know Miss BJ, you know, and she she would sit at the front desk. Hey, Daryl. She'd ask, she's asked about my school and all that stuff. And then he walked down the hallway, say everyone's name. I said, man, he knows everybody. And then as time went on, I developed that same thing. So all the companies that I work with or work for, I knew everyone's name. I would connect and collaborate. So I think a lot of times if you're present and if you're mindful, as you reflect your past experiences, that should direct your new strategies and, and new initiatives in your future. And so my whole life has always been about seeking out the employees, seeking out the little guy, because the little guy is making the greatest impact because they're client facing, they're customer facing. And I know that the amount of good information that I could give to an executive is good, but imagine if I took that same information and gave it to their entire workforce, how much more impactful will their organization be to their customer base? I love that. It reminds me of a story I wrote about my my most recent book, The Relationship Economy. And uh, Walter Bettington, I think the third, he's the CEO of Charles Schwab. And he tells a story that when he was in college, his goal was to get a 4.0 all the way through. And he got it. But one class was standing in the way and, and he, he's at his final exam, final test ever. And I forget what the, you know, let's say economics, something like that. The teacher comes out and says, uh, listen, I've taught you all I could teach you about economics. He goes, well, just take a piece of paper out, takes it out. Everyone takes it out. And he says, you know, this is, you know, a Tuesday night course. Every Tuesday night you guys come here and every Tuesday night you see the janitor in the hallway. I want you to write down that janitor's first name. And Walter Benning and uh, the third, I think, uh, didn't know it. And mm. he didn't get straight A's. It ruined his straight A, <laughs> but it taught him an invaluable lesson, right? I mean, you know, how many times they walked by that guy through the, the semester and all that. So, yeah, that's a great story. Wow. It sounds like, you know, your family taught you really good life lessons as well. Yeah, because people 
and our what we say in engage at engage 365 is the people are the greatest asset of an organization and on a more macro level people are the greatest thing in the world so if we're not engaging people if we're not knowing names then we're missing out on amazing opportunities whether to impact their life or that janitor might have something for you right right listen you know, people like that, they're kind of invisible to the rest of the world, but they hear things. They hear what mm-hmm. students are saying. They hear what, you know, there's another story of a of, uh, of five diamond resort, Nemecolon, used to ask their shuttle bus drivers for what they're hearing. Because to us, we get on a, 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 a shuttle bus because ta- the property was so big, it would take you from one building to the other, to the spa, to the activity centers. And we kind of, you know, a, a, as guests, we would get on and kind of not realize that they're there. And we maybe complain about that server or I can't believe they didn't have us for, our, you know, or it could be the opposite. That is a great place to go for critical information Brilliant. that you'll never get from anyone else. I like that. So you've been doing this for six plus years. Uh, your, your company uh, engaged 365. How other than, uh, you know, uh, I think there's there's positives to every negative situation, you know, back when uh, you were a little boy, right? 9-11, um, you know, mm-hmm. the, the positive of that gave us great respect for our first responders, right? They never got the respect that they deserved until that, until we saw what they did. The pandemic, a lot of, a lot of negatives, but one of the positives is that, that, you know, we realized as business leaders, we were taking our employees for granted, right? And, you know, I, I get mad when people say there's a labor shortage out there. No, there's no labor shortage. It's a turnover crisis. We still have the same amount of jobs and the same amount of human beings to fill those jobs. But it was like a near-death experience for everyone saying, you know, they reevaluated and they had a professional awakening saying, I don't know if this is what I want to be doing with my time here. And so how has that shifted? If anything, I know it was a good thing for a business like yours, a business like mine. Finally, people, business leaders are giving the employee experience the props and the attention it deserves. But has it changed anything of your approach and and, and the way you coach and consult businesses? I don't think that it has changed the way that we engage the employee, but it has illuminated what we've been saying for this whole time Yeah, that you must engage your employees. We talk about how employee engagement, it doesn't secure, it's not an automatic fix, but it retains your talent, especially when you have people who feel like you believe in them. People w- want to work for companies that work for them. And so we were saying this over and over have you invested in them? Are you creating opportunities for them to gain more information, to develop personally? Are you creating growth journeys? Are there employee journeys in your organization where people don't get stagnant, don't hit a ceiling? And so we, we've been saying this for a while. And now the employee has the power now. It feels like this is, this is, I think you might enjoy this, but I feel like the employee experience right now is similar to free agency in sports. So now the employee can say, oh, hey, Walmart, Target said that they're going to cover our college tuition. And so now they get to jump to a new team, new contract, new opportunities. And so the question is, and, and this is, I'm just using this as an example, but Walmart, what will you do for your employees? And so I love the balance between the two. I, I do not want us to create more self-absorbed narcissistic employees, but I do think that there's a balance and a mutual level of respect and understanding that that both the employer and employee should have. And if you're not engaging your employees in this era, you are going to, you won't not have talent, but your talent is not going to be the top level talent that will then be the impacting, you know, the greatest level of impact for your customers. Yeah. Hire less, hire rock stars. And the yes. rock star yes. they'll outperform. You won't need as many as you used to have, but you gotta you gotta pay them and help them, you know, with their skill sets and evolve as I think people, as professionals, but also we, you know, I think the other thing that came out of the pandemic, it was a wake-up call that it is leaders and businesses' responsibility to help everyone with their their mental well-being, right? And oh, yeah. 
offer resources and, 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 you know, we, we never cared about that, you know, and that, that was never, you know, a part of businesses, but I think if businesses want to compete, they need to address it and they need to, you know, have recommendations. They don't have to have a therapist on site, but just recognize right. and, and offer resources that employees that can deal with it themselves. And what just as importantly, some employees don't have, let's say a, a mental health well-being issues, but someone in their family does. And right. that's still a struggle on them if it's their wife or their kids. So just you know, showing that it's not just about how much you can produce for me, but I also oh, yep. care that you know you have a happy home life and all those other things that, that, that are really good. What are some other things that are really important to employee engagement? So I, I would say this core four. So the first is, is there growth? Does the employee feel that they can grow? Now, the cool thing about growth is it doesn't always have to be growing vertically upwards in the organization. It could also mean, could they get external or extracurricular growth? So I might be working for a specific company, but the company is giving me X amount of dollars so that I can learn finances or I can, I can, you know, learn how to build my credit. So that growth money management classes, how to buy your first home, right? There you go. There you go. Yeah. So that, that one's major. The second one is benefits. So employees wanting to know that there are things that their company cares about more than just their work. And so, you know, what's the package? What's the program that I have as far as benefits are concerned? And then second, a uh, third to benefits is the environment in the workplace. So you think about Google, what they did years ago that transformed the, the those physical work workspaces with chefs and gyms and you know, and I mean now they've got like childcare on site. So not every organization has the resources, or is it responsible or or wise for them to bring on all of that? But you have to find your niche and, and find you know what you can create as far as the experience in the environment. And then I'd say the last thing is, do you create culture? And th these are not chronological. They're, they're all four essential. But what I'm seeing now is that most people, you, you might appreciate this, that there was a time when people clocked out of work and then they went to their social group, their church, their school, their nonprofit organization, their community group. Now, especially because of the pandemic, your business is all you have. And that's not a blanket statement. I don't want to say that most people don't go to those other places anymore, but now my employee is my my group friend or or my you know we we we're seeing more relational equity inside of the organization so what are we doing to cultivate that and if i'm working for your organization i want to know that you're putting culture first that you're creating opportunities for connectivity and not just work so those those four are something that we've we've seen a lot right now on the, in the workplace the core four growth Benefits, environment, and culture. There you go. Right. Good. Love there it. Love go. it. And, you know, Jess, who you know, one of our uh, uh, senior consultants, she might have got this from you, but she uh, brought something back and, and spoke at it last year at, the, at our uh, Customer Service Revolution Conference and said, do you have a CFO? And, uh, you know, who has a CFO here? Everyone raised their hand. And she says, no, no, I, I don't think, you know, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, financial advisor. I'm talking about chief fund officer. And, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, and, and who wouldn't want to do that and making sure that, hey, we were all going to the ball game, you know, a week from Friday night, if anybody wants to go, you know, it doesn't mean the company has to pay for it. Right. But it's just it's right. just these group outings and stuff. Oh, yeah, because the people love it. They they want it. They love it. And that actually impacts the Monday that they return and go back to work because the synergy is there, the excitement is there, the innovation, the inspiration is, is really, it adds more value. And once again, it always goes back to the customer experience. So right. if, you, if your employees are having these transformative electric moments with each other, then they're gonna bring a different version of themselves to work. And, you know, and, and that's so true. What's experienced on the inside will be felt on the outside. And, you know, one of my, another favorite quote for leaders is, Go show the proper way, and when necessary, use words, 
right? I love, I love that, right? Instead of just saying, hey, Jared, why aren't you doing better at customer service? And where's that report? And where, why, why, why aren't you more motivated? I got to embody that. And if I come in and I'm positive, I'm bringing a positive energy. I say, Jared, you crushed it yesterday. Great job. And really proud of how you're, you know, you're working, you know, that situation out with a client. Well, now you're experiencing it and you're going to want to give that. And, and so, you know, I think as leaders, we talk too much and we don't embody the behaviors we want our employees to experience. So true. So true. How are you addressing the work from home quandary? So there, here's the cool thing about technology. I think a lot of times technology gets a bad rap from from leaders, business leaders, uh, when it comes to remote work or employees leveraging technology more more so than the human engagement. But so we developed an app, and I think that when you can create an application or uh, for a business owner who's buying one or utilizing one, and you can allow that thing to to be aligned with your business strategy. It becomes a resource, a tool. And from that, there's so many ways that it actually connects your people and it empowers them and it saves time. So with remote work, I think there are two things that we've learned. Is that the name of the app, important. Remote Work? So so the app is actually called Huey, H-U-E-E, Human Engagement. H-U-E-E, that's our... Yep, H-U-E-E. And we will have uh, in the show notes a link to that. Yeah. For sure. For sure. And and basically Huey has is become an intranet for companies who, you know, that we work a lot with franchised companies or small businesses to mid-sized businesses that need an intranet, but they need it to be dynamic and gamified for their employees to win rewards and points and fun stuff like that, but also for them to communicate. And so we don't want people on the app all day long, but the app can be leveraged for a greater purpose. And, and, and finally, with onboarding and training, you know, we want employees to get on. So when you think about remote work, a lot of employees who are getting newly hired, because remember, their great resignation required a lot of companies to hire new people. Well, then if you're hiring me, but the office is shut down and I'm working remotely, how do I get engaged with the culture and how do I learn? Because I can't go into the break room and have that conversation with the person who's already been there. No, we have to um, replicate the current conversations that, you know, I used to bump into you back in the day as we're waiting for your coffee or mine and, and say what's going on. And you tell me about something yep. good or bad. And I'm like, oh yep. man, you know, I got experience that I can help you with that or or good luck with that or whatever. Right. We don't have that anymore. That conversation and, and, and is that's gone. where I always say emotional connections are found in the rabbit holes. Like when we go down a rabbit hole and we find out something about each other or, you know, but when you have a meeting, whether it's on Zoom or even in an office, you know, the meetings are from one to two and there's a, a there's too much in the agenda for that. No, we got to go. Skip, skip. It never allows for rabbit holes, but rabbit holes traditionally happen if me and you showed up to the meeting five minutes early and we started chatting or, you know, at the Keurig machine. And that's the biggest challenge is we have to find ways to replicate the Keurig conversations in the work from home situation. And that's so important. So we have employees who get onboarded and then they use our app and they have all of their, we have an LMS on there. So they're getting all of their onboarding training on there. Then they have resource folders. Then they have articles and FAQs. So some of their questions that they were going to ask, they can search and they can get the answers to those questions before they had to go hunt down somebody. And they don't even know who to hunt because they're new. Um, so, so is that, this that's an app really uh, for both leadership and team members? Absolutely. Absolutely. The entire organization. Okay. And is it similar to Slack or, or, or something like that? We probably have some components that are like Slack. I think what adds to what we do is we have an intranet and the business leader, the owner or management team, they can shoot out announcements that go to everybody. In addition to that, you get your own profile. So where Slack is more of a, and this isn't about us versus Slack, but where yeah, Slack yeah. is more of a communication-centered yeah. uh, program, this is more an intranet for your entire, it's an experience of your entire organization. And if I get hired platform. today, it could go out to everyone and I could start getting kudos and introductions Boom. from people and maybe they can share. Right 
hey, this is uh, John's background. He has three boys and he likes to do this on his free time. And all of a sudden, you know, you're reaching out to me as my new coworker saying, I got four girls, you know, we got to, you, you go. know, yeah, something like that. Yeah, love that, love that. There you so go. Good. Yeah, because every everybody struggles with onboarding, training, and engagement. Yes. Onboarding is rough. Training is old, you know, and then engagement. How do we even engage each other? So that's what we wanted to knock out with that. And then as far as the remote work, another component that we provide is coaching. So for you to be a new hire and, and similar to how I met Jess with Link, well, they had these groups, CS team, account management team, sales team. And those teams are having group coaching sessions with me or, or my coaches. And so when they're in those, when you just got hired and then you join this meeting, that has nothing to do with business, but more so engaging you, that's a great introduction to your organization where you get a coach that's fully interested in how you can assimilate through through all of the ambiguity about, about where you're working. So that's what we do, our application, our coaching strategy, and then we do some high level consulting as far as your engagement and strategy. But it has been really cool helping companies with the remote experience and then helping them get back to hybrid. We we think that hybrid is the future. We think that that if every organization, you go too far, if you say you got to be in the office every day, nine to five, and then you go, I think you go too far on the other end. If you say we're remote, never come in. So how can we perfect your hybrid envi environment? Good. I agree with you a hundred percent. COVID didn't change anything. It just accelerated, uh, you know, it, yep. in every capacity, hybrid, you know, from telemedicine to conferences to work, you know, we got to be flexible as leaders. Yep. But I also agree that going extremely one way to a uh, remote option will hurt the chemistry. And we do have Absolutely. to, you know, for, for the reasons we just discussed. Want to improve your company culture and become the brand your employees and customers can't live without? Email Claudia at the DeJuliusGroup.com to find out about consulting, executive and online training, and other resources we can offer you. You can also schedule a call with Claudia by going to tdg.click forward slash Claudia. So as someone in your shoes that works at a lot of great companies and ha has created some great uh, systems around this, what do you think is the most common blind spot for a leader and, and or for a company that can cause less of a culture than we want, right? And I'm sure it's 100%. no different from your, your days in sports, professional sports, college sports, to uh, in organizations. It's all the same, right? But from your experience and working with so many companies and helping them with their culture, what do you think is the first thing that could be uh, our blind spot? It's absolutely positively empathy. There's a reason why coaches, uh, uh, basketball, football, uh, uh, different sports like to hire former players as coaches because they've been through what the players have been through and they're going to be able to connect. That's where they got, the, they coined the term players coach. There's a reason why Chick-fil-A has an LDP program for current employees to become operators of the newest Chick-fil-A's because we are all looking for the people who understand every level of the organization because they've been there. And when they do that, their level of empathy is much higher than the hired gun that, that just went from a management opportunity one place and now is managing in a new place. There's nothing wrong with those people, but if they do come in and they haven't been up the stream or up the ladder of an organization, they have to be experts at empathy. Because if I don't understand my people that I'm leading, and if I don't care about where they are, where they're coming from. And lastly, if I don't do anything with my employee engagement surveys, which we've seen a lot of companies, they just have the survey and they think that that's, that's it. And they're not taking action uh, upon the, the findings in those surveys. Then there's Gary, gonna be- Gary, let me, I just jump that. in that's there because it's such a hot point that you're yeah, making. Yeah, please. I say the second worst thing a company can do is not, survey their employees all right not do employees that's the second worst thing yeah yeah. yeah. what's the worst thing <laughs> the worst thing is to do it and to not do anything with do it. it exactly exactly the worst thing is please answer these questions and we don't do a damn thing 
right? Absolutely. Now you're ticked and off. I'm take I all took my the time, time my day. Yes. And I shared, and and my desk is still broken. The heater still doesn't work in the winter. And, yep. you know, all, all the, whatever, all the stuff that got. And I say, employee engagement is great if you do something about it. And you have to come there back and say, you guys gave us great information. Here's our task list. Here's our highest priority. Here's why we can't do some of these things today. Right. You know, might be budget. It might be whatever. It might be, you know, because we have this going on in one of our businesses is, you know, we just did it. And, you know, there's some complaints about things that haven't been fixed. And we said, well, you know, we we need to be more transparent. We're moving locations. So Mm -hmm. that's why we don't want to, you know, invest, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to fix this when in the next three months, we're probably not going to be here. So, but yeah, yeah, I love that you bring that up because nothing will crush an employee's morale worse than they feel that they're not listened to. If they're not heard, then there's an immediate ir- relational disconnect, which means they're going to look elsewhere. Right. And the next time I ask you to fill out that employee survey, you're going to laugh and roll your eyes and say, yep. I got better things to do with my 15 minutes than write out something they'll never get, you know, any time uh, from leadership. So, yeah, yeah, there I get I get a, uh, passionate about that because people check Likewise. boxes and say, hey, we do employee surveys or even customer surveys. Well, that's not, that's 10% of the job. Right, right. What will you do with this information? And will you overcome your ego or your lack of competency? Maybe you say, I got this information. I don't know what to do. Okay, hire someone, a consultant that could help you with that information yeah. or, you know, but do something. Don't just sit there. And, and, and uh, you know, some of the best companies, a, a good friend of mine, he's actually been on the podcast twice. He's a Nashville native. If you haven't met him, you have to. His name is Arnie Mulham. Built and sold three businesses. Best-selling author of Worth Doing Wrong. He's all about culture. And Arnie is just amazing. And uh, something that he uh, did was for both clients and employee surveys, he would uh, have his clients survey every quarter and employees, but he'd make it public. For wow. all the clients could see what other clients may be bitching about, all the employees could see. And you wow. know, I said, Arnie, are you nuts? He goes, I know I, I thought I should have my head examined. He goes, but you know, it does a couple things. He goes, let's say, you know, Ginger says, you know, you know, something wrong with this place. She go, he, he goes, A, it makes us held accountable, right? We have to go. do something with that if someone said. But he goes, John, you'd be surprised. You think people would start piling on saying, you're right, you're right, you're right. Employees were, you know, kind of going at her saying, you're crazy. You've not worked anywhere else. This place is the best, but, you know, and so it kind of took care of it. Wow. You know, and he did it for his clients and his clients would see what other people were talking about. And which, you know, I I loved it. It's putting your money where your mouth is because now you see what the complaints are and you know, and you're going to see if they get fixed. Versus and transparency. I just, yeah. Uh, versus yeah. I, if you took a survey, you could say, hey, whatever happened with the new, you know, uh, coffee machine? I could say, you know, you're the only person ever complained about it. So it wasn't worth fixing. Well, right. now you know if that was true or not, because when you yeah. post that, you know, how people, you know, commented or said, yeah, that thing is archaic or it serves all the purposes I need. I'd rather see the, the money go towards, you know, something else. So, yeah, yeah I love that. Good. I love that. And empathy is a big thing. And so you're saying it could be a lack of empathy in the leadership, not towards the the frontline employee? Yeah. So the leadership might say, I mean, I've been in in offices with with leaders one-on-one where they say, oh, man, my employees are dumb. You know, I mean, you know how people talk in certain offices. And it's like, okay, with that type of mindset, there's no way you're going to be able to impact them to the level that they're going to do what you really wish for them ultimately to do. But then even more importantly, from a more moral standpoint, like you need to love people more, you know, you need to care about people more. Yeah. You know, and that's a taboo word and it shouldn't be is like, you know, it's ridiculous. I fall in love with my employees. Right. I I mean, I I, I love like Jess, right. You work with Jess. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love her. I love her husband. He comes over for our parties and he's my uh, cornhole partner. Um, Nice. 
But I mean, that's when you really get to know people and in and, and some bigger companies. I don't know everyone in, in, in one of my companies. It has over 100 employees. But I know my direct reports and I really care for them. But, you know, you bring up a good point. I was uh, I had a workshop yesterday in San Antonio and they were talking about how employees can get really upset, you know, if their hours or commissions aren't right. And, right. you know, they could they could, you know, I said, but you got to understand something. Right. I mean. Uh, this was me back when I was a frontline employee. I already figured out what I'm going to make next Friday's paycheck. And I've already spent it, right? I've right. already spent it. And now you didn't put in the right hours or sales or commissions. And whether I'm, I'm $15 short or $80 short, I'm screwed. There's a domino effect that I'm bouncing checks and I can't get the rent paid and all that. And that's the empathy that we have to remember that, you know, maybe today at a higher leadership level, that $15 or 15% of our paycheck isn't going to throw us into a tailspin, but it will right. them. And it's also, like oh, yeah. I say, when an employee gets a, their first car, right? It might be a beater, but my first car that I got was a 1971 Pontiac Le Mans. And it shouldn't have been allowed on the road, right? I mean, it was it was a beater. But I will tell you that that car is still my most proudest vehicle I've ever had because it was mine and I saved yeah. up for it. And it, it was in my name and I had to pay the insurance and no one gave it to me. And I've been you know luckier to drive some fancier cars off showroom floors since but nothing's right. more special than your first, right? And, of course. And that's why I say, like, knowing what your employees, if, if, if your new employee just got, you know, a, a keys to their first car, keys to their first apartment, that's huge in their life. And that's where you oh, really yeah. can make an emotional connection of saying, Jared, tell me about your new car. And, you know, oh, how cool. And whatever it is, it's fast. It has a big engine. Whatever Jared likes about his new car, have him tell you about it. And, you know, you care. And, and another thing I think is, is a miss is I think as leaders, we have to show our vulnerabilities and yes. that we weren't always perfect. And I struggle with that or I, you know, whatever that may be, but it really humanizes. And it also shows that this didn't come easy for me either. Right. I struggled. Right. And, you know, and I, I think all this, what you're doing is fantastic. Um, and I, I want to add a point to that. That, please. that doesn't get talked about a lot, but it's going to be on the forefront in this era that we're getting into with millennials and Gen Z. Uh, employees. This is the first time ever that an entire generation has been this level of disadvantaged or fatherless, broken homes, divorce rate higher than ever in, in, in history. And then we we can add on the bullying. And finally, their experience on social networks. They, this is the first generation that was born into the social media era. Yeah. Therefore, they have a strong desire for connection because of a lot of their past have not been as favorable as they like. Right. And so they're looking at their manager or their boss as really more than a boss, more than a manager, someone who will support them. They're looking for father figures, mother figures. Right. And if you don't get that moving into this era, you're going to miss it because these young people want to really know you. They want to relate to you. They want, they want to tell you about their favorite place to hike, their favorite cup of coffee and which is different than most generations, this younger generation doesn't feel the goosebumps or the butterflies when approaching a manager or when approaching a CEO. They'll walk right up to a CEO. Hey, what's going on, Jim? Like, it's a different era. So the need for transparency and to be able to adapt to this new generation is going to be very important. And so you have to learn how to engage that. No, well. That's huge. You know, you bring up so many good things. You know, I, I say, you know, they're, they're only grown up in the touch screen era. They are relationship disadvantage at no fault of their own. You know, mm -hmm. we handed our kids an iPad to keep them busy so we could get whatever I call we them wanted. Digital pass by, pass right. Buys, yeah. Right. You know, and so that's so, you know, they, they, they you're right. The highest generation to have single parents, Depression rates from you know, depression, anxiety, kids. suicide, yes. skyrocketing and medication. And that to me is the benefits. One of the strongest benefits a great company can provide. I think great companies and great leaders primary job is to help people lead great lives.
right? And, yes. and, and, and with a sense of purpose and, and we got to help them. And it's on us to do that. And I love millennials and Z's. I, I have no understanding why my generation beats them up. Number one, we're the generation that raised them. So we're just right, criticizing right. ourselves. But, you know, I, the, the, the currency for uh, millennials and Z's is, is, is purpose. And when you it is. create a sense of purpose, they crush the previous generations. They oh, will yeah. stay and give up better deals on paper if they feel that their job is tied to this. So oh, I yeah. actually love what you're doing, what you're bringing. Before we get into what our attendees can learn from you at this year's Customer Service Revolution, tell our attendees where they can learn more about you, Jared. So engage365.us, that's our website where you can get fully immersed into everything that we do. Um, we'll also provide some of the socials just because we're LinkedIn and, and uh, Instagram and, and, and all those things. But I think the that biggest will all thing be in is, the show notes, how you can follow Jared, his website, Engage365, the link uh, to the website, Hue, the app, Huey, did I say it right? Yep, H-U-E-E. H-E-E, yeah. yep, absolutely. And then we also just launched a new platform called ex365.io. And that is for, remember I talked about the extracurricular, the personal development outside of business. So it's a, it's basically a learning management system. It's an experience. We call it Experience 365. So how can someone go to ex365.io and jump right in and fully embrace their purpose? We have a module where you can find your purpose, where you can uh, learn more about intrinsic motivation, where you can learn about how to make deep connections with your circles. So it's, it's really cool. But those are the kind of the elements Really what it comes down to is we're building content, we're coaching, we're providing webinars, we've got an app, we're doing all of this stuff to engage individuals and make their life better, like you said earlier. Love that, love that. And so excited to have you as one of our, our, our experts, because this is such a big topic, presenting at uh, the uh, 2022 Customer Service Revolution in Cleveland, the customer service capital of the world, where we're going to have, we're going to break attendance records. Our tickets are just booming right now. We expect to have well over 700 people from all over the world in person. So tell us, uh, our, our listeners, what they can learn from you. So yeah, we're going to be talking about the engage equation. So everybody has been trying to solve this equation, right? So how in the world can I get people to where they need to be? And we call that transcendence. Transcendence means that the individual lives above the basic physical level or the basic employment level. So when you think about tennis, automatically you thought either Serena Williams or you know whatever other player. If you think basketball, depending on your generation, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, these people transcended their industry or their organization. And then the list goes on, Steve Jobs, you know, Elon Musk, these people are transcending things. So how do we get employees to transcend in their workplace, in their, in their organization, and in their industry? Well, the equation is this, it's intrinsic motivation. That's what they bring to your organization. So intrinsic motivation is broken up into purpose, mastery, and autonomy. I have, and you said purpose earlier, I have my purpose. And the reason why I work with this company is because my purpose aligns with the purpose of this company. And so I'm, I'm motivated every day to do my job well. Then I have my level of mastery. I want to be excellent at what I do. And I want to be coached by my managers, by my leaders to be excellent, to be great. And then the autonomy, there's a, there's a certain level of autonomy that I desire in my, in my organization. And I'm depending on my leaders to provide that autonomy for me. Now that's what they bring. The leader, the manager brings intentional inclusion. So once again, transparency, am I including you into some of the things that we used to not talk about? We didn't used to tell that bottom level, entry level or mid-level, some of these secrets, you know, about the organization, or am I including you into certain meetings? Am I including you into certain initiatives? Am I including you into a committee to, you know, do community impact, community service? I have to include you so that I can meet you in the middle between your intrinsic motivation and what we're trying to accomplish with that inclusion. And when those two things meet, leaders who are engaging people and people who are engaged by their intrinsic motivation, we see the most transcendent people in teams. And that, my friend, is where 
you see companies like Chick-fil-A thriving. You see companies like SpaceX thriving because these are people who feel like they matter, they're valued, they're heard, and their managers are not egotistical. They're, they're, they're transparent and they're humble. And these teams are unbreakable. That's where you get a Phil Jackson and a Kobe Bryant. You know, it's like both levels are engaging each other and they're winning, they're winning, they're winning. That's awesome. So, so this is going to be mostly uh, or all leaders at this conference. So you're going to teach them. They're going to walk away after hearing your presentation and be able to get more engagement out of their, their employees. Absolutely. They should know how to identify or how to create environments where employees can learn about their intrinsic motivation. Cause some employees just don't know. We want them to learn how to produce an environment of intrinsic motivation, but then also what does it look like to intentionally include my employees? What, what's the boundaries? What are the, the, the levels uh, as to how far I should go with that? I don't want to just make this thing a circus. I want to be mindful of what we're trying to do with our business initiatives, but what, how do you learn the skill of inclusion, the skill of engagement, the skill of making meaningful connections and supporting your team members and leaders under your leadership. So hopefully they should walk away knowing this is how I engage my people, understanding their intrinsic motivators, understanding purpose, mastery, and autonomy, adjusting whatever needs to be adjusted in my organization. And then how do I engage them and include them so that we can help them reach transcendence? I love it. I, I cannot wait. This is exactly the uh, piece that so many of our, our uh, clients and leaders are begging for. And that's why we went out and got the best at this. And uh, all of you can get a chance to see Jared Green live at the Customer Service Revolution Conference, November 8th and 9th in Cleveland. We'll put a link to that as well. And Jared, I, I wasn't kidding but to the audience that he, you have four daughters, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Four daughters. They keep all you busy. Under eight. <laughs> all under eight. Oh, my gosh. And I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're working on a book. I'm working on a book. And the book is actually called The Engage Equation. Um, and so so the book, I'm, you know, as a subject matter expert, I've been sinking my teeth or an aspiring subject matter expert. I've been sinking my teeth into the the science behind intrinsic motivation um, and the growth mindset of leaders uh, who can, you know, include them and what, what inclusion looks like and, and how to balance that and then ultimately transcend it. So looking at stories of teams and organizations that have done this and how successful they've been with fulfilling those teams. So everything is moving at the right pace. So Hopefully, this could be an opportunity for the actual announcement or book launch. Of so, what what's your so what, I'm, I'm expected the end of this year, beginning of next year? The book will come out. Oh, yeah, the book will be done this summer. So, it, it should be one of those situations where awesome. you heard so, it, take it home with you. Yes, awesome, Jared. I cannot thank you enough for what you're doing. I think it's vital to workplace happiness, which will only help businesses be more successful, grow. Uh, the right way. And I'm thrilled that you are presenting at uh, our, our revolution this year. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. All right. I want to thank all you revolutionaries for another episode of the Customer Service Revolution podcast. And we will see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Customer Service Revolution podcast with John DeJulius. Did you enjoy this episode? Consider leaving us a review. We value your feedback and love to hear how you're using the podcast in your organization. To hear more, be sure to subscribe now on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for being part of the Customer Service Revolution. Revolution.